Welcome back to In Other Waters. Last thing we did was go to the Central Reef Way Station and do a little bit of research there. The next main goals we have are to go to the suit transponder that's been detected over here, thinking that's probably going to be Manet. And also, we read some notes about, about something called the Bloom here. Apparently, we can't cross it until we have better propulsion, though. And I think we might have to cross that to be able to get to the suit transponder. Not sure, but I think so. So those are our big goals, and then we also have all sorts of research that I absolutely want to get around here. So for now, let's just go back to the way station and explore from there. Blooming stalk. This stalk is leaking spores from a wide slit in its side. They're carried across the soft sand by the currents coming from the East Reef. Towering outcrop. This feature rises steeply towards the jagged edge of the reef, splitting the strong currents like the head of an axe. Glittering stalk. Sample candidate. This stalk clings to the edge of the nearby outcrop, away from the loose sand of the central reef. Shrill sax. Split gullies. These gullies lead among the lead among the tall outcrops of the northern edge to the currents and open waters beyond. Let's make our way east to the source of that transponder signal. I don't know what to expect. If the transponder is Manet's, there's some history between us. But I haven't seen her in years. Not since... Look, you don't need to worry about it. Let's just find her. Right, this is to the east, to the suit transponder. I don't think I want to do that yet. That's main quest stuff, you know? Northern Passage. Were these rifts and canyons really carved by the currents? Or are they violent fractures now smoothed by erosion? Protected Pass. In the shadow of these huge outcrops, this pass leads towards the rift at the north edge of the reef and its fast moving waters. northern edge. From here, the reef descends into the unseen deep. Spores spiral by in the fast-flowing water. What else lies out there? Oh, we can see that current. That looks strong. This side of the shelf is sliced at, but the planet's oceanic currents. Look at those flecks of organic material. They're being cycled back into the reef's ecosystem drifting from unseen places out in the ocean. It must be part of some vast process. Do you think we'll ever understand the cycles of this ocean? Yeah, eventually. I hope so too. It's just so intimidating. An entire planet of life and just us to study it.
layered outcrop. The pale strata of this rock tell an ancient story. Might there be a fossil record within such rocks, waiting to be discovered? Bare boulders. The stalks are noticeably absent from the sides of this northern rift. Why do they leave such a clear buffer zone beside it? Sandy shelf. The pale sand is unmoving here, but to the north I can see the yawning chasm and strong currents of a wide rift. Now that we're so close to the way station, I feel like it's a good idea to go max out our power again, fill up. There we go. Calm waters. The central reef way station lies within a bubble of calm but just to its north, a massive rift brings strong currents through the reef. Rift Passage. The passage between these rocks leads out into the howling currents of the northern rift. Northern Rift. The northern rift is the largest of the cuts into the central reef. Crossing it without some way of navigating its currents would be suicide. Impressive. This split in the shelf is incredibly wide. And deep. Those currents would smash us against the rocks if we swam out into the flow. We're going to need better equipment if we want to cross that monster. Strong currents. Flecks of spores and other organic material whip past in the current, dragged into the dense stalk patches in the west. Empty shelf outside of the shimmering perimeter of the western stalk forest. Almost nothing lives or grows on this finger of the reef. I think I might like it zoomed out a bit. It does give me more of an idea of what's the topography around us. Open sand. This western side of the finger becomes increasingly enclosed by rocky outcrops as it leads towards the shallower water. Metal debris. It looks like Monet has had to salvage parts of the base to build what she needed to survive. She must have been here many months before I arrived. Smoothed pebbles. Large smooth pebbles sit in the sand, and beyond I can see the suns catching the amber terraces of another stock forest. The suns, plural. Boulders. Some ruined equipment lies in the shelter of two boulders. An early way station site, perhaps? Open sand. Across the open sand, I can see the faint shapes of stock colonies rising up in ordered rows.
glittering stalk. At the edge of the strange terraces of this underwater forest, this stalk sits like a sentry, armed with a coating of bubbles. forest. Patterns of stalks stretch back into the distance, pathways and terraces of some unknown design. This must be the western stalk forest. Row of stalks. Unlike in the southern reef, the stalks here are ordered in curving rows, tightly packed and evenly spaced. growth. This growth is bloated and distended, the panels of chitin bulging outwards, and between the seams, something flows within. Bloated stalk. These stalks bulge out from their bases, forming... Oh, I've started locking data on these strange inflated stalks. They look ill. Um, these stalks bulge out from their bases, forming rounded, pulsing growths that look discolored and stretched. Can we take a sample? No. glittering stalk, another of the reef's tall stalks dotted with translucent bubbles. Ah, I'm full. Stalk pathway. To the west, the stalks spread in thick pathways, curving between strangely corroded stones. Curving avenues of stalks seem to mark a loose perimeter around each bloated growth. Why? Sandy clearing. A pulse can be felt, running through the shelf from the north, making the sand ripple in small, soft waves. Another bloated stalk. The membrane of these stalks is thin enough to be translucent in areas, stretching to breaking point by whatever's inside. Bloated growth. This pulsing growth sits in a strangely shaped clearing. What causes the stalks to grow like this? There's something I'm not seeing here. Stalk pathway. Clearing these stalks is a delicate task, 
and I hope that their retraction is temporary and not some terminal state. Glittering stalk. These bubble skin stalks keep their distance from the bloats, as if they know the danger they pose to the stalk colonies. stalks seem to be precisely spaced out between the stalks. Are we damaging this colony by disturbing them? Some vein or root must run through this spot as the sand rumbles with unseen movements. Are all the bloats connected? Bloated stalk. When alarmed, these stalks burst open, releasing their toxic contents into the local water. Could they be defending themselves? Stalk pathway. It seems unlikely that the bloats are simply individually diseased stalks. Their growth pattern suggests a system, a process. Bloated growth. With its chalky covering melted away by the bloat, this rock has a dull metallic sheen, spectrums of light reflecting across its surface. The pulsing, pumping rhythm of these stalk's contractions suggests that some process is happening inside them. Beyond these stalks, I can see a sheer ridge rising up to the north. Northern Ridge. North of here, an angular ridge ascends, cutting the shelf in two. The only way further north is to cross the rift to the east of here. Hollow stones. Tucked into the side of this corroded rock, a pile of stones with worn holes sit in the sand. Within a hole, something glitters. Ooh. What's here? It's an animal. It's an egg. Striped egg. An egg sampled from a spore-lined nest. We're going to have to study that when we get back to the way station. Clearing stalk. Behind this tall stalk, layers of thick growth surround a maze of rocks, blocking the passage back east. I am full.
stalk pathway. This side of the colony loops back towards its center, leading deeper between the stalks. Whoa. Microbial. Not that, this. Spark colony. Toxic microbial colony found inside bloated stalks. We made it explode, it finally completely burst. So if a shrill sack goes off near one of them, that's what makes it explode? Bloated growth. These bloats pulse unnervingly, as if at any moment they might burst open, choking the water with a microbial cloud. Shall we do it again? We have no idea how this is affecting the local ecosystem. This could be quite bad, actually. Uh. Oh, it's, uh, it's very quickly draining my oxygen to be here, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. Let's not stay. Ah, new species logged. That's enough data to log and classify these inflated stalks. I'm going to call them reef bloats. These large bloated stalks that burst easily, or large bloated stalks that burst easily, expelling the toxic microbes held inside their bodies. Their movements suggest unseen processes. Okay, let's go. Uh, eh, here. Stalk pathway. I'm not going to read the description. I want to leave. Uh, it's still affecting us here. We need to move further away. Western wall. The western wall rises up towards the shallowest part of the shelf, just meters below the surface of this planet-spanning ocean. Okay, now we're good. Ah. Cavern. Dark cave. Below the steep wall, a dark crescent-shaped sinkhole cuts into the shelf. Fallen rocks from the wall are strewn across the sand. Horold Passage the walls of the passage twist inward with thick veins of growth. We must be heading beneath the stalks. Bloated roots. Thick bloated roots poke through the rock wall and something pulses within them. This is a rare chance to sample the stalk root network. Ah, I gotta dump something. Uh, oh, I don't have to actually... Uh, pop it outside the ship. I could use it for a little bit of oxygen. There it is. Bloat root. Sampled from beneath a stalk forest.
colony's edge to the west stands a final pathway of stalks before the colony fades out into the sand and rock. Glittering stalk. This stalk sits on top of the corroded husk of a boulder, melted down to little more than a pebble. It would be easy to become lost in the complex patterns traced by these rows of stalks. I wonder where they lead. Bloated growth. The stalks form a loose perimeter around this growth, which bulges unsettlingly as if it's about to burst. Stalk pathway. If these stalks are isolating the bloats, perhaps it's because they're dangerous to the colony itself. The stalks seem to be growing around the bloated growths, isolating them from each other. What purpose does this serve? I don't want to burst this one, and I don't think I need to go up because I think we've already been there. Or have we? I'm actually not sure if we've been up. Uh, well, I might be okay if I do this. Oh, I burst, <laughs> I burst another one. Just not the one right next to me. Uh, yeah, we've been there. Oh no. Glittering stalk. Sat silently among the terraces, this stalk bristles with bubbles waiting to breach at the first sign of a predator. I need that. Bloated growth. The rock behind this growth looks as if it has been melted. Its layers whirl in distorted forms, revealing a metallic core. So it's acidic. Stalk pathway. As they curve south, the stalks meet the rising wall of rock, which shelters the southern reef. Thin passage. Between the rocks and the stalks, a thin sandy passage leads towards a clearing. Stalk clearing. A small clearing between the avenues of stalks. To the west, their ordered rows dissolve into the chaos of the southern forest. Clouded shell. Fragments of a shell, recently shed, glint in the sand like shards of cloudy glass. What creature left these here? I think we're going to get another vital sample. Do we have room? Yeah. Clouded shell. A piece of a creature's shell with a cloud pattern. 
We've gotten so many great samples. Should probably head back. Our power's a little bit low. Nothing alarming, but low-ish. look out of the circle that I keep tunnel visioning into, we're very close to the way station. so chill. Okay, sample store. This is... A stock spore. That's a unique thing, right? Was it? I don't remember. Well, it won't let us put it in here if we've already... Actually, yes, it will. It will let us put it in there. <laughs> uh, anyway, this root is unique. This bacteria is unique. The shell is unique. Uh, let's take a look at the dive map. Did we get everything that was on the list? No? Bark. Sing stock tissue, reef stock root. Didn't we get that? Maybe we need to study them, or maybe that's a different type of root. Bloat root. We're not quite done. We still need a food sample, and then we'll get a sketch. But now we have a theory. Chemical analysis of a stock scraper shell confirms that not only are they made from stock membrane materials, their distinctive cloudy coloration comes from stalks too. Stock coloration, like most fungal coloration, is reflective of the local water acidity in the medium the fungus grows in. This variance of amber, orange, yellow, and even green pigments is passed directly to scraper shells when consumed, resulting in beautiful whorls and blobs of color. A scraper shell is a living record of every stock colony it is fed on, and therefore a marker of territory and social standing. Scraper shells could be used to help study the entire reef and its shifting ecosystem, each one a chemical map of the local history, readable for those who can learn the significance of its forms. That's so cool, a record of everything it's ever eaten. And we have a lot on the reef bloat. Oh, I think we've finished the reef bloat. Well, let's save the sketch for last. Uh, actually, uh, we never read observations because this is a brand new entry. Reef bloats are large bloated stalks and can be found at the western border of the reef. Intimidating in their size and distorted shape, they resemble inflated sporing mushrooms, covered in nodules of rampant fungal growth. Their membrane, which is stretched by the bloating process to an almost translucent sheen, is darker than a typical stalk, making the stalks themselves a shade of sickly orange. What role the bloats play in the reef stalk network is not immediately obvious. 
but their pulsing pumping motion suggests that the bloats are either processing or producing the toxic microbes that are contained within their fragile membranes. Without analyzing the microbial colonies themselves, this will be difficult to ascertain. Behavior Laboratory analysis of the microbial colonies found within reef bloats, spark colonies as I have come to call them, shows that these microbes are not of a group typically associated with stock colonies. In fact, spark colonies appear to be made up of highly modified algae with a wide metabolic range, able to consume carbon dioxide, oxygen, metal, and toxic compounds with equal ferocity when supplied, when supplied with a source of light. When metabolizing these substances, spark colonies produce a regular flow of charged electrons, making them ideal for use within a microbial fuel cell, or MFC. Their suitability for this use is suspicious. Are they really naturally occurring microbes? And why are they found only within reef bloats? Something isn't right here. If they're not naturally occurring microbes, then what does that imply? That Manet may be modified the local ecosystem to support them? To give them fuel? The theories. Finding a root sample from a reef bloat has brought with it confirmation that reef bloats are not manufacturing spark colonies, but instead modifying, metabolizing, and processing them. Analysis of the bloat root system has shown the presence of microbes at various stages of modification, including those that have been entirely detoxified and their rampant metabolism, metabolism neutered. If all reef bloats are connected via this root system, then they may be part of a large-scale cleanup operation with the aim of eradicating these aggressive microbes. Reef bloats are not diseased stocks, then, but powerful biological engines, which are fueled by their local stock colonies. The scale of this operation suggests that for the stocks, the spark microbes are a significant threat. That is so cool. Okay, let's look at our first sketch. Chitin seams, sensory stocks at the top. Bulging discolored plates, split stalk, microbial release stages. That's so cool. Looks like there's one sample that we need far south, which I think is around where we came from originally. And then two that look like we'd probably get to them by going roughly east, heading in the direction of the suit transponder. Let's get this one down here, the Singstock Bark. We found a calcified stock here. Yeah, I remember finding a calcified stock. So let's go back to the Central Reef Way Station and then head south. Sampling available. Good, because I'm out of shrill sax. Sorry for scaring you. Just more shrill sacks. Might as well grab them, though. Plenty of room.
Wait, stock bark. Isn't that new? Oh, we got a couple eggs too, because I didn't throw all of those into our base, because we only needed one to study. Oh, the spark colony gives us a lot of power. Striped egg gives us a lot of power and oxygen. So there's the stock bark. And here's the striped egg. has been updated. Oh, we have a sketch now. But first theory. Analysis of the spore catcher egg shows a strong correlation between the mineral it contains and the minerals present within the catcher's favored spores. It seems that through the spores, stalks are able to affect the catcher's egg production, therefore controlling the volume, traits, and behavior of catchers within any area of the reef. In a sense, the stalks have domesticated the catchers, leaving the two intrinsically linked as species. But the question of what the catchers provide the stalks remains. Do catchers serve a specific purpose, consuming unwanted or incorrectly configured spores, for example? Or are they kept for other reasons? Could the catchers be kept by the stalks for their companionship and social use, just as humans keep pets? So that's the spore catcher. Beautiful. Siphon flaps. All right, these are the things that are incredibly agile. Stock scrapers, behavior. Analysis of stock bark shows that it's chitin-based as suspected, containing glucose and high levels of polysaccharides. This makes it an ideal food source for the scrapers. But not only this, it makes stock membrane a vital substance for lichen scraper shell formation. The more stock membrane consumed, the larger and thicker a scraper shell will become, which explains the variance in scraper shell size and translucency. Going further, shells may also be markers of a stock scraper's importance within the community. A larger shell means a more effective grazer, and therefore a more preferable partner. Further analysis of scraper shells is needed to continue this line of inquiry. Oops, didn't mean to do that, hold on. The stock scraper. The sing stock. Behavior. Analysis of the stock bark sample has given some new insights into the sing stalks. Their entire biology is compressed into the chitin plates that surround each specimen. They are completely hollow. In fact, rather than being a single large stalk, sing stalks are actually many spirally entwined stalks which weave together to form a pillar like shell. The scraping of these stalks as they move against one another produces the stalk's harmonic hum, which may not be a form of communication with other colonies as first thought, and instead a kind of internal metronome, there to synchronize the movements of each individual stalk within the weave of stalks. But if the sing stalks are the bark that surrounds them, this brings with it a new question. What do sing stalks contain? Further analysis is needed. Yeah, they can't just be an empty void. There has to be something in there, right? Okay, now just to go east. 
in the direction of the transponder signal, and we should be able to get two more samples out that way as well. Sing stock tissue and reef stock root 